The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. You take good morning church i hope you're having a blessed day we are going to finish second peter chapter 3 today we're going to be studying verses 11 to 18 today and i'm just so excited because second peter chapter 3 is one of my favorite chapters in the bible because it unveils one of the deepest revelations of god of god's long suffering peter says one thing there's one thing i need to tell you I mean, that's just powerful. There's sometimes, you know, people have asked the question, if you could sit down with anybody in all of history and say, tell me something, you know, people always like, if you could, if you could just have a conversation with anybody alive or dead, and you could just sit down and talk with them and have a conversation, what would you ask them? What one thing do you want them to tell you? What truth would you want them to explain to you? You know, we we look at powerful communicators and and wealthy individuals, and and that's why they have interviews. I want to ask you questions. I want you to tell me those things. And it always ends an interview with, is there any last thing you want to say? Is there any one main takeaway from everything that you know? What would be that one thing? Well, for Peter, that one thing was the understanding of God's long-suffering. God's ability to endure adversity when man is an adversary to God. God doesn't immediately judge. He long suffers so that people will be born again. That's why I'm doing it. I'm not executing the fierceness of my wrath. I'm not executing the fierceness of, fierceness of my judgment as fast as you think I do because I want people to get born again. I want everybody to get saved. Now we know everybody doesn't get saved. But God's allowing man to choose at the deepest level of the heart. There will be a great ingathering of souls. There will be a great harvest at the end of the age in which the environment becomes cultivated. It's where man will have to choose at the deepest level of the heart, whether they want God or not. You have a great harvest of people coming in and turning to the Lord because of the things that are happening during that time. That's what God long suffers for those people to get saved. God's also long suffering for people that are in sin that will turn to him for them to get born again. And there'll be a lot of people that are in sin that will become resolved in it. They'll become resolute in their transgression and their rebellion against God. They won't get born again. But those people also have choice. And God's letting man become resolved in choice. That's why he's enduring. The adversity of man. Man's heart is only evil continually. Man in its innate nature without the born again experience hates God. And God has to endure that. I mean, place yourself in God's shoes. If everybody in the world hated you, would you be able to endure it if you had the power? You had the power, boom, you could judge it right then. And everybody in the world would be judged. Like, would you long suffer? Would you endure that adversity day after day after day where man walks in sin, man walks in rebellion, man walks in transgression against you? Would you endure it? God does. And God endures it because he wants us to be saved. He wants all men to be saved. All men doesn't get saved, but that's what God wants. You know, people all the time say, well, if it's God's will, then it'll come to pass. Well, God's will is that all men be saved. It's said right here. But we know all men don't get saved. Why? Because man has free will. God won't violate your free will. That's why he's enduring. He's doing everything he can to open your eyes, to call you to see him and to turn to him. 
And the, and the greatest way that happens is in the generation in which the Lord returns through raising up the Antichrist and the judgments of God. All of those things are to stir people to repentance. You may say, how do you know that for sure? In the vile judgments, the greatest judgments that touch the entire world, 100% of the world gets touched because of the vile judgments, it says that they still repented not, which means it was still available to repent. Man still had a choice. God was still doing everything he could to get people to turn back to him. I've heard Mike Bickle say, God is using the least severe means to cultivate the deepest level of heart response and choice. It's the least severe. God could not go any less or any more. If he goes any more, he'll start violating people's free will, so he can't do that. And he won't go any less because it won't produce the deepest level of response. There's that man in the great tribulation that's going to turn to the Lord and give his heart to God and get saved, be with the Lord for all of eternity, that walked in sin up until that moment, was never saved, was an utterly rebel, was an other transgression and sin, but he'll give his heart to the Lord. God's enduring for that man, for everybody that will be born again. That's why God's doing it. And it's through understanding that that we understand our role in this process as the body of Christ. So let's read all of 2 Peter 3, and I want to just talk one more time about the responsibility of the believer. I don't know if I prayed yet, so Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let the word become wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of your Son. Spiritual seed sown, producing in our body, mind, will, and emotion, transforming us by the renewing of our mind, conforming us to the image of Christ, growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. 2 Peter 3, we'll start in verse 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water, and in the water, whereby the world what world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now the same Word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we... According to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. And account the long suffering of our God is salvation, even as our beloved Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of the, these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace, and in the knowledge of of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. 
Now that's a powerful chapter. And I, and I love the fact we finally got to read the entire chapter together because Peter starts by saying, I'm going to remind you right now of what God did in the old days. What God did in Noah's day when, not, when, when God flooded the earth. He said, you just look at that and understand if God said he would do that and he did it, if God says he's going to burn the world with fire, he's going to do that. Bring assurance into the fact that God will never violate his word, ever. God said he'll do it, he'll do it. There'll be people that'll mock him. There'll be people that'll contradict him and blaspheme God and, and say everything evil against it to try to get people to believe that God won't uphold his word, but God will do it. He said, those people don't understand. He said, but you, my church, be learned, be not unlearned, be not ignorant of this one truth. He's telling the church, this is going to happen. God will judge the world by fire. The judgments of God will come. They are assured. God's character has never been violated. Everything he said he would do, he has done. And the things that he has said that have not come to pass yet will come to pass. Be assured of it. Don't be ignorant of it. I don't care what anybody else says. If God said he was going to do it, he will do it. And then Peter says to the church, learn this one thing. You do not perceive time in the way God does. A thousand years with the Lord is one day and a day is as a thousand. What you see as 2,000 years of church history in God's eyes was two days. It was that quick to God. God's intervening almost immediately in history. You know, something happens. God intervenes. Boom. God shows up and intervenes. God, it's been 2,000. No, for God, it's been one day. You don't understand time like God does. Your perception of time is very different. Time is the relationship between two events. We see the relationship between Jesus and his second coming is 2,000 years. And God says Jesus to his second coming has only been two days. He was just there. God sees the relationship between events very, very different than we do. Peter said you have to understand that. Because it's through understanding that that you could understand long-suffering. You see it as 2,000 years, you'll see it as a delay. You'll start to mock and you'll start to come against and contradict what God already said he would do. God must not be doing it. He must just be delaying. He must not uphold his word like he does. That is what makes you as the evil servant out of the parable of the faithful and the evil servant in Matthew 25. And in that, when you think like that, when that's how you speak, you will end up falling away from the Lord. That's what that leads to. That's why I'm very big and very bold to correct and to rebuke the body of Christ in this area. Well, God hadn't done it yet. That doesn't mean he won't do it. It's just because you don't understand. You are ignorant of God's truth and the way in God, which God perceives time. Well, God gave me a promise. It's been five years. It hasn't happened. For God, that's a minute. You don't see it the way God does. And that's okay to be ignorant it's just not okay to stay ignorant. If you don't know, learn today. I'll even tell you, as uh, Peter said in chapter 2, it had been better for you to stay ignorant than you for you to hear me say this and then willfully rebel against it. It had been better for you to stay stupid than hear me tell you right now that it is God's long-suffering, God doesn't perceive time the way you do, and then you turn around and go into sin anyway. That's outright rebellion. You will face judgment for it. Because that will lead you away to denying the Lord and damn your soul for all of eternity. That's where it ends up. People are like, it's just a little bit of sin in the meantime. Well, when the Lord comes as a thief in the night, you'll be cast into outer darkness. Is it worth that? No. See and perceive the way God does. I'm very bold about this, and I, and I want you to start to understand that God is seeing things from a different perspective, and we need to see them like God does. Because Paul then, because Peter then, my probably not Paul, Peter, then says an, an amazing statement. And we've said this many times as we transition from Old Testament to New Testament. Obviously, we're going to bounce back and forth between the Testaments reading the end time narrative. 
Well, actually, we're going to finish the New Testament scriptures and then we'll go back to the Old Testament. But inside of these passages, something I really want you to understand is that every time Jesus, Peter, Paul, John would talk about the end time narrative and talk about the end time scriptures, they would always connect it with a command, with a commission to walk out obedience. Over and over and over, it's not just knowing the narrative to know it, it's knowing it to apply it to our life and how it changes how we live now. Because Peter said, because you know this, because you know God's long-suffering, God's enduring adversity, because he wants people to get born again, because you know that's why it's happening, because you understand that for God, God's intervening right on schedule. He's never behind. He always upholds his word. He always upholds it. Because you know those things, he said, then be looking. He said, have holy conversation and godliness. All of it in every aspect of your life. He said, you ready for this? Looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God. Prepare yourself. Because you know this, it changes how you live right now. And everything you say and in everything you do, he said, make yourself positioned looking for the second coming of Christ. There's so many people I know that, yes, Jesus is coming back, but that's not what I'm looking for. What I'm looking at is God to give me a little bit more money, heal my body, put some power and some miracles on me, give me some anointings and give me some grace. That way I can get some promotion I can grow to ministry, I can get a big church, and I can be well-recognized, and everybody will know my name. Peter would say, I rebuke you for that. That's not why you know these things. And that's a wrong understanding of why we study. You know, we, that, that is the perspective of a lot of the body of Christ. It's the Laodicean spirit of compromise. God, I don't need you, so I'll just go and do what I want to do. It's wrong. It's ungodly. It needs to be adjusted. It needs to be corrected. The other understanding, not just that it is the understanding of not caring about the end time narrative. There are people that care about the end time narrative, care about the biblical scriptures, but I want to know so I can be somebody. The end time scriptures is not about being somebody. The end time scriptures is about preparing yourself. I don't, I don't, care about studying the end time scripture so I can know you don't, you need me, I get predominance, we grow a big church. It's not about that. We teach the end time narrative to prepare the body, you ready? To remain faithful, to walk in holiness, to walk in obedience, to go faithful to the Lord all the way, to never quit. I don't teach the end time narrative because I want to teach the end time narrative. I teach the end time narrative because it's the way in which God has ordained the body to grow it into a mature bride. You grow in fullness of maturity when you see his second coming. Because it means what I do right now matters. I've said this so many times. I I love saying it though. Especially because we pastor pretty much an all black church and I grew up, I'm in the black community so much when I'm in Chicago. It's people say, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good, but you're wrong. Because if you were 100% heavenly minded, you would be 100% earthly good. Peter didn't say, focus on getting some money, growing your business, having a good family, having some kids, and, 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 and uh, uh, yeah, having some good relationships. Focus on that and you'll be all right. No, he said, look at this looking for and hastening, which means to prepare yourself unto the coming of the day of God. Prepare yourself for the Lord's return. You ready for this? Peter said it 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, he said, prepare for the day of the coming of God. How much of the church is ignorant of the coming of the day of the Lord, illiterate on the truth of the end time narrative? Yet Peter said it's that is the focus of the life of the believer. Well, what if you don't see it? Who cares? What if you die before the Lord returns? Who cares? It's not, Peter didn't put a qualification on it that this passage, though it is specific for the generation in which the Lord returns, Peter didn't say only the generation in which the Lord returns. You are the only people that need to prepare yourself for the coming of the day of God. No, for 2,000 years, the church should have, though the church hasn't, 
needs to be looking for the coming of the day of God. That was supposed to be your perspective as a believer for all of church history. The entire church should have been focused on this the entire time. But we've been so focused on power, miracles, prosperity, all this, that, growth. It, it, it became the American dream gospel. It's not the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom is sacrifice, obedience, holiness, faithfulness unto the Lord. It's looking for his second coming. It's the Maranatha message. He came, but he's coming again. It's the promise of the second coming. It's the promise of the resurrection that produces faithfulness in the heart of the believer. I love the fact that he says, accounting that the long suffering of the Lord is salvation. This is what you call, this is what long suffering is all about. It's about salvation. I tell people all the time. People look at me and they say, I don't want to study end times. I just want to win people to the Lord. Love God and, and get people to love God and get saved. You ready? Long suffering, the end time narrative, the coming of the day of the Lord, God's judgments. You ready for this? Is salvation. That is the salvation message. People always are just looking. I'm going to preach about the cross. Okay, that's great. I love the cross. It's what brought you back into relationship with God. But it's not just the cross. You see the cross and then you look for him to come back. I mean, the angels, Peter and all of them, who saw Jesus in his resurrected body, ascend up into heaven. Two angels looked at them and said, why are you looking up? Why are you looking at his first coming? He will come in like manner again. Look to the second coming. We appreciate the first coming. We love the first coming. We are thankful of everything that God did when Jesus was on the earth. But he's coming back. You are married to a bridegroom who is returning. I'm not focused on the fact he left. I'm focused on the fact he's coming back. The church has been so focused on the fact that Jesus left. Okay, yes, he did leave. He ascended, but he's coming back for me. And because he's coming back for me, that is what I put as salvation. It's God's long suffering is salvation. That's what I account it as. That's why it's so important. And Peter said, Paul wrote all of these powerful things in his epistles and the wisdom and the revelation of God and there are a whole lot of people that said you can't understand it you can't study it you can't have revelation and Paul said that's their own destruction these things are easily understood he goes these are things so easy it is our steadfastness when Paul said the power of the resurrection people are like that's so hard to understand it's not hard to understand it's the truth and the hope of the believer. It's the promise of God's long suffering. It's the promise of the resurrection. And it's these things right here that produce steadfastness in the heart of the believer. What I care about is you remaining faithful to the Lord. People are like, I'm saved. I love that. I want you to stay saved. I want you to get born again, but I don't want you to get born again to turn around and denounce the Lord a year later. I want you to get born again and stay born again. I don't want you to get born again and backslide from the Lord. I did that. I don't want that for you. I want you to get born again and stay radically faithful to the Lord. And the way in which that happens, the way in which that is produced in the believer, is through understanding God's long suffering. Be like, I want to grow in grace and have the promises of God manifest in my life. I want to have more knowledge of the Lord. I want more of the grace of God. Rewards, prosperity, healing, miracles, power. I want these things at a greater measure in my life. You ready? You have to focus on the coming of the Lord if you want that. If all you do is focus on prosperity, miracles, power, all of that, you will have a measure of it. Yeah, you might see some things happen in your life. But it's only through the focus of the return of the Lord, the coming of the day of God, that will actually be the full reception of promise. I teach people, take our discipleship curriculum and get a foundation. Take our advanced curriculum and get the fullness. 
and then take the end times curriculum to have a focus on the coming of the day of God, the return of the Lord. We know all these other things, but they're foundations. They're the fullness of God in us, but they're not why. It's not like you can walk in the faith movement, but the faith movement, the fullness of God, these things are great. But it's only knowing his return and focusing on that that will produce obedience all the way into the end. A lot of people that do faith in God for years and fall away from the Lord. There's a lot of people that do salvation and getting people born again that fall away from the Lord. But it's people that focus on the second coming of Christ that never fall away because they're always waiting. They're always expecting. They are focused on the reception of the promise. You ready? That will only come at the return of the Lord. That will only be received in eternity. And it's because of that. If I can never get it until that moment, I have to remain faithful until that moment. I love this passage. I know I just... I'm getting fired up and I'm, I'm kind of hammering these things, but I just want you to be blessed in this. And I want you to have this move on your heart as much as it moves on my heart, because Peter made such a powerful statement. I encourage you to get all of the teachings we have on long suffering, one thing, days of Noah, because it's all of those understandings that it's focusing on the coming of the day of Lord and preaching that to others and putting that as the focus of our life. The return of the Lord that produces obedience at the level that you never fall away. If the great falling away is of the same magnitude as the Antichrist on the world stage, we need to prepare a people to not be a part of the group that falls away, but to be a part of the group that prepares themselves as a mature bride, arrayed in white to remain faithful unto the day of the coming of the Son of Man. Because in an hour as you think not, the Son of Man will return. Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. I give you all the glory for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Church, I love you. God bless you. I pray you have a great day. And I hope to see you in church tomorrow. But I pray you have a great day. And we will see you then. The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow. Oh, the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons. The drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. You take The sun's not worried about the winter, cause soon it will pass. The light's not thinking about the darkness or the shadow it casts. A heart that's planted in forgiveness doesn't dwell in the past. So why should I be? Cause you take good.